Thank you. Well, if you've ever been to Europe, uh, it, it, there, there are places where things seem very strange to me as an American. And one of the things is, is there is a cafe, in, and half of the cafe is in the Netherlands, and half of the cafe is in Belgium. And they've got a line down the, the, the center showing you which side you're in. Are you in the Netherlands or in you, are you in Belgium? It was especially interesting because for years, the law in the Netherlands required restaurants to close earlier than in Belgium. And so at one point every evening on the Netherlands side, the restaurant would have to quit serving. And if you wanted to continue to eat and enjoy the restaurant, you had to go over to the Belgium tables. It's a fascinating thing. And you can truly stand there and have one foot in both worlds. And I thought about that as I was preparing the slides for this morning. Because uh, one of the things that I've noticed in my life is in a sense, I can separate my faith into two different categories. It's like there are two legs to my faith. And as I look back at my faith over the 51 years, uh, uh, 52 I guess uh, almost, years that I've been alive, I've noticed the, these two different aspects of my faith. There's one that I'm calling my cerebral faith, my intellectual faith, that rational mind that thinks there must be a God, it only makes sense, or it best makes sense, as I rationally think through the evidence. But then I've also got this other leg that, that what I'll call experiential faith. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ that is as real in my life as the relationship I have with my family with you. And, and that's not to say that, that there aren't at times where you don't sit there and doubt some of this. There absolutely are. When I was in my 20s, I can remember when my cerebral faith was really challenged and seemed to shrink. Because I was questioning, how much can I really be confident that there is a God? And my studies really challenged me on whether or not Scripture was indeed holy Scripture. And it was during those times where my cerebral faith was really challenged that my experiential faith seemed to take over in some ways. And I was reminded of the Scripture, I know whom I have believed I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that I've committed to him. I know whom, not what, not how, but whom. I have a relationship. And in those times where my mind was challenged and my faith was challenged, my experience in Jesus Christ was so real and so valid that it carried me through those tough times in my 20s, tough intellectual times. Now roll into my 30s. It was almost the exact opposite. In my 30s, I went through a time in life where I, did, I couldn't find God. In my experience, where was He? I mean, why was this stuff happening in my life that should not be happening? I had not turned my back on him. I had not left him. I had sought him with my heart. And this was happening. And my experiential faith just seemed to shrink. And it was then that my cerebral faith got to step in. And there are psalms like Psalm 42 and 43, which in English we have separated into two psalms. But in Hebrew they were one. It's an acrostic psalm where each verse starts with a successive letter of the alphabet. But in that psalm, you've got the psalmist who's got a huge problem with his experiential faith. How can this be happening? Where is God? He says, where are you? Are you even there? And then his brain kicks in where his experience is failing. 
And as his brain kicks in, he says, why are you downcast, my soul? Why are you disquieted or in turmoil within me? Hope in God. I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Look, I don't feel it. I don't see it. It's like he has left me high and dry. But the psalmist says, I know this to be true. I remember what he's done before. I know who he is. I know what his power is. And regardless of how I feel, I know that he will be faithful. The amazing thing in those two psalms that, that really carried me through this, these years in my 30s was that the psalmist says that not once, not twice, but three times. Because after each time it's like, okay, now I believe it, but I still don't feel it. And he walks right back through how horrible his feelings are and he says, but I know that I shall again praise him. And he says, but I still don't feel it. But I know over and over again. And that's the way it, it, it was for me. And please understand, I like it when both legs are strong. But when one experiences some weakness, it's nice to have the other one to help take up the slack. And with that, we turn to Habakkuk. Because Habakkuk had some very serious questions about God and about what God was doing. He had intellectual questions and he had experiential questions. So as we look at Habakkuk, I want us to just take one little step back. One of the things we're trying to do as we work through this Old Testament survey is instead of just dumping everything on you all at once about the minor prophets, we're kind of parceling it out. A spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. So we're kind of picking a little bit extra each time, and it's the snowball rolling down the hill. And by the time it reaches the bottom, it should be a huge snowball for you. So let's add just a little bit more, which means we take a little step back. The Old Testament. Now we think of the Old Testament. Here's my Old Testament right here. We think of it as a book. Or a collection of books. But we've got to remember, books didn't even come into vogue until the 2nd, 3rd century. Originally, what it was was a bunch of scrolls that were kept in the cabinet at the local synagogue or the temple. And so you've got a collection of scrolls. And in the Hebrew mindset, they originally divided these scrolls into three different sections, maybe two or groups, buckets, whatever you might call them. There was the Torah, Hebrew word that means law. Those books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they were the core, the, 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 the measure of everything. Here is God calling, here, well, God setting it up, the problem being created, God announcing his solution, and then God calling the Israelites out as the nation of choice through whom the solution would come. And God sets out who he is and how he would expect human behavior to be in the earth, in their time, and in their day. And so the law is the core and the measure of everything. Then there was a second group of books that were called the prophets. And what the prophets did is they explained how the Torah should be lived out. In other words, how are those principles lived out in, in real life, in real circumstances, in real situations? Now, when we think prophets, we think the big ones, you know, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. And then we think the 12 minor prophets. But in the Hebrew reckoning, the prophet group or the prophet bucket also included the history books of Joshua and Judges. Included uh, the Kings, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, the 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 because those history books were compiled and put together through prophetic voice through the prophets to show how the Torah principles would be lived out, not just as individuals but as the nation of Israel. So we have the law bucket, we have the prophet's bucket, and then the third bucket to hold these scrolls were just called other writings. 
And these were writings that would encourage and help you navigate in and out of life's challenges. This includes the, the major one being the Psalms. So we'll see Jesus talking about uh, uh, the law and the prophets and the Psalms which are the three categories. The other writings include more than just the Psalms, but they're the major one. Other times, Jesus will just divide it into two. You've got the law and the prophets, which is also fair because the prophets helped compile the Psalms and other things as well. So with these three different buckets... I want us to focus now on the prophets for a moment. And as we think about the prophets and we move towards them, just another little uh, part of the snowball rolling down the hill for you to put into your mind. We're Western Greek thinkers, by and large, in 21st century America. Not all of us. But most of us are Western Greek thinkers. And as Western thinkers... The heritage we have inherited from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, uh, uh, all the way through is linear. We think in terms of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And we can draw a circle around it. And that's the way our mind processes. We like things in chronology. We like things in order. And we just tend to function that way. The Hebrew thought in biblical times, Old Testament times, was not linear. And they didn't all have mandatory math class. They didn't all read and write. The Hebrew mindset was very relational. So you give them one through nine and a circle around it, and instead of laying it out linearly... They might lay it out more relationally. Turn some of the letters sideways. Put it all together. And there you've got the Hebrew mindset. So when we read the prophets, we should not assume that they're starting at point one and working their way to point nine and then drawing a bow around it. They may take one and turn it sideways. They may take two and move it up there. Three becomes an ear, four is more hair, five is more hair, six and nine, they make great eyes. Seven, turn it upside down, you got a nose, eight's the other ear, then you can draw your circle around it. And you've made something beautiful. So when you read the prophets, by the way, thank you to my wife Becky for that uh, drawing. I, I tried to do it and it did not quite look human. Um, but I'm a Western thinker. I did the bottom part, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and I got it in a line because I am linear or linear, depending on how you pronounce it. So, um, either way, it comes real natural to me. And so, with that in mind, I want us to read the prophets, but remember as you're reading them, you know, we just want to sit down as Western people and start with chapter one, verse one, and read to the end and try to just boom, 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 boom. It doesn't always fit together that way. So, Let's look at Habakkuk. And I'm not sure if that's fair or not as who should be Habakkuk. Uh, Becky did a good drawing, but I think he might be a little bit upset. So I asked Dale Hearn to help me find some better pictures of Habakkuk. And he found <laughs> Chewbacca. And I said, no. <laughs> emailed him back and said, no, Dale, not Chewbacca. I need Habakkuk. And he said, well, how about uh, him? That's Bert Habakkuk. And I said, no, 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 Dale, that won't do either. But then the more I thought about it, the more I thought, actually, that's pretty good. So we're going to keep, uh, nothing personal, Bert Bacharach and family, but we're going to keep Bert Habakkuk around as our example of Habakkuk, uh, both because he's Jewish and he wrote songs. And Habakkuk has a song in it. So I thought that might be good. You see, Habakkuk has three chapters. Two chapters are a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. The third chapter is a song. So um, it's not like, uh, uh, I don't know what your favorite Burt Bacharach song was, but I was thinking about playing Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head because Habakkuk does complain all the time in the book, but I did, left that alone. Let me tell you this, though, as we look at the dialogue, this makes Habakkuk different than all the other prophets. 
all the other prophets generally will have some narrative, but it's an oracle. Here is the word of the Lord. This is true because the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. In Hebrew, kipi Adonai deber. The mouth of the Lord has said it. It's an oracle of God. Habakkuk is actually just a dialogue between him and God. It reads in some ways a lot like Job. And so when we understand that and we break it apart, we can read it a little bit better. So let's do that. Now, it starts out with Habakkuk complaining. Habakkuk is complaining in chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, about the violence and the injustice that is in uh, 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 Judah. Judah. Here is, you know, it, it, it says this is a prophetic book. This is the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. That's verse 1. But it's not an oracle as much as that's just what the entire book put together is. It's a dialogue. Habakkuk starts out complaining. Habakkuk says, Yahweh, how long am I going to cry for help and you not hear? How long am I going to call out? You're not listening. I cry out to you, violence. I'm showing you things that are wrong and you're doing nothing about it. You aren't saving. Which, I might add, is your job. (laughs) Now, why do you make me see iniquity? Why you idly watch? Why are you making me do the watching while you're not at work? You're not doing your job. There's destruction. There's violence. There's strife. There's contention. The law is paralyzed. There is no justice. The wicked are surrounding the righteous. And justice is perverted. Now that's bold. To say to God. This is after Josiah, the good king, has died. Let's put it into context here. When Josiah, the good king, is dead, Assyria still has a good bit of its empire, as you see. But around Jerusalem, Israel has kind of found some measure of independence. Egypt has got its power resurging. Pharaoh Necho is over there. Babylon has resurged. That's the green. Babylon and the Medes start to fight against Assyria vociferously. And as they close in on Nineveh, they conquer Nineveh, destroy much of what Assyria has. The few Assyrians that are left, and there aren't very many, they retreat over to Haran. In Haran then, the Babylonians come at them. The Babylonians start smashing them in Haran. And at this point, Pharaoh's concerned. Because if there's no Assyria, there's no buffer between Babylon and Egypt. So Pharaoh Necho II decides that he's going to go up and help the Assyrians keep the Babylonians in check. On his way, he gets up to Megiddo and he goes through the mountain pass north of Jerusalem. And that's where Josiah decides he's going to ride out with his army and stop Pharaoh and the cavalry from coming to rescue the Assyrians. Pharaoh says to Josiah, what are you doing here? I'm not fighting you. I'm going up to deal with Assyria and Babylon. Leave me alone. Josiah says, oh no. I'm big, I'm bold, I'm 39. And Josiah, bless his heart, is so convinced that he's so right, he dresses out of his king's clothes and puts on his everyday fighting clothes and just is out there like any other soldier until the arrow pierces him just like any other soldier and he dies. So then Pharaoh Necho, having just defeated Judah, continues up north to Carchemish, and that's where the Egyptians and the Assyrians join forces for that last stand against the Babylonians. The battle at Carchemish ends with a massive defeat of the Assyrian slash Egyptian coalition. The Assyrians are wiped out, never to be back as a nation. 1,500 years of history, poof, gone. 
Meanwhile, after this battle at Carchemish, Pharaoh Necho, he turns around and goes home. Now, for 150 miles, the Babylonian, Nebuchadnezzar, the general, is chasing him down and engages him again and manages to beat him. But on his way back to Egypt, Necho stops in Judah and says, Oh, by the way, you, son of Josiah, I don't like you. You're too much like your dad. I'm taking you off the throne. I'm going to put your brother in the, your place. And so you've got now these two sons who have reigned in place of Josiah. Josiah, great king. Sons, bad, bad, bad kings. Bad kings. Judah, now part of Egypt as a vassal. So let me tell you how bad they were. We can look at a contemporary of Habakkuk. Jeremiah was writing at the same time. And Jeremiah has a message to the sons of, of King Josiah. Uh, Thus says Yahweh concerning Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah his father, went away from this place. This was the first king that was deposed by Pharaoh. Look what he says about him. Woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness, his upper rooms by injustice, makes his neighbor serve him for nothing, doesn't give him his wages, and then compares, Jeremiah compares this evil king to his daddy, good king Josiah. Says, didn't your dad eat and drink and do justice and righteousness, Zedek? Then it was well with him. He judged the cause of the poor and the needy, and then it was well. Is not this to know me, to be just? to care about the poor, to care about the needy. Isn't this to know me? But you have eyes and heart only for dishonest gain, for shedding innocent blood, for practicing oppression and violence. Now that's the condition of, of Judah. That's what's causing this complaint if we go back to the PowerPoint, that is the complaint that Habakkuk had. There's violence. There's injustice. Oh, for the good days of King Josiah. But now we've been left with his runt boys. And they've really just turned this whole thing upside down. And God, you seem to be doing nothing about it. Now, would you please do something? And God answers. He says, oh, I'm going to do something. I'm going to take some people even more wicked than, than you got in Judah. You think it's bad now. I'm going to judge Judah with these really, really rotten people. I'm bringing in the Babylonians. And, and I'm going to take care of this injustice problem you've got by bringing in a bunch of people who will totally rip you to shreds. That's called, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. Here's the way it went down in, uh, in the passage in Jeremiah, I mean in Habakkuk. So, God answers Habakkuk. Habakkuk's been complaining about how justice. God says, okay, look out beyond Judah and get ready to be astounded. I'm going to do a work in your days. You won't even believe it. I'm raising up the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans. That's the marshy part of Babylon. You might know a biblical town in Chaldee. Who came from Chaldea? Anybody? Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. We say Chaldeans, but it's Chaldean. Abraham. So where I called Abraham forth from to establish the Holy Land, I'm going to bring those people, and they're going to destroy the Holy Land. I'm bringing them, the bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth, 
They seize dwellings that aren't theirs. They're dreaded, they're fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards. They're more fierce than wolves. They just go on and on and on. They come from afar, flying like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. You think it was violent in Judah before. You wait till I send the foreigners in to judge you. Because it's going to get worse. Their faces forward, they gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress. They pile up earth and take it. You get the picture? you got a fortress. you got these walls. They just pile a bunch of dirt up to the top of the wall and make a dirt ramp. Take the city. They had these siege machines that they could roll up. They sweep by like the wind and go on. They're guilty men whose might is their God. They don't worship Yahweh. They worship their power. They're intoxicated with what they can do and they do it to the nth degree, in an abusive, unjust, violent fashion. So, hey, don't worry that you've got problems in your country and I'm not doing anything about it. I'm going to judge you. Well, you're going to be stunned to find this. But after God's answer, Habakkuk has a little bit more complaining. This is kind of like, what? What? That's not what I was asking. I was... We're not like ships passing in the night, God. My complaint was, I'd like an easy life. I mean, I'm looking out for the poor and the needy. And I wanted you to look out for them too. And what you've just told me is, yes, you've got injustice. And yes, I'm going to fix it by bringing in a greater injustice. God... Here's a disconnect. This does not make sense. Let's go back to the Habakkuk and see how he says it. So Habakkuk says, Look, I thought you were like from everlasting. Oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we're, we shall not die. Now that is not, I suspect, the best translation. I think the NIV actually follows a better manuscript on this. That says, God, you're not supposed to die. But a lot of translators say, well, he wouldn't be saying God wouldn't die. And he doesn't mean it literally. It's figuratively. And the point's the same anyway. You know, aren't you from everlasting? Aren't you the Holy One? You're not supposed to die. You, you, you're, you're supposed to still be doing your thing. Now, if you have ordained the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, as a judgment, and you, O rock, have established them for reproof, it doesn't make sense to me because you, God, are of purer eyes than to see evil. You can't look at wrong. Why are you idly looking at traitors and remaining silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? Now, I agree that we're unrighteous in Judah, but we're a whole lot better than those guys you're bringing in. How can you just sit idly by? At first, I didn't understand how you sit idly by while we're wicked. But now you tell, well, I'm not sitting idly by. I'm bringing in a more wicked people to wipe you out. That just doesn't make sense, God. What you've done is made mankind like the fish of the sea. The crawling things that have no ruler. That, that the Babylonians can just bring up with a hook and drag them out with a net. We don't have leaders. We don't have a, a, a God to take care of us. You've taken the creation story and turned it upside down. Instead of your last act of creation being the, the, the goodness in, in a man and a woman. You've relegated us to be in the fish and the creepy things. The things that the Babylonian fella, Nebuchadnezzar, can gather in his dragnet. And, and, and it's not like he's good about it. He's not giving you credit, God. He's sacrificing to his net. 
He's making offerings to his dragnet. He's living in luxury. His food's rich. Because he's just killing and taking everything that's not his. It's not like he's giving you glory. Why should he get to trump us when he's more evil? Now, I love this verse. Here's what I'm going to do, God. I'm going to take my stand at my watch post. I'm going to station myself on the tower. And I just want to see how you're going to answer this. I'm going to look out and see what you're going to say to me. I want your answer concerning my complaint. That's the setup. For God's second response. And God's second response is, Oh, when I bring in the Babylonians to judge Judah, I'm not done. I will be judging the Babylonians as well. I'm not done. Judgment will come. Let's look at this dialogue. We won't go through each verse at this point because of time. But there are a couple of things that I want to make sure we pull out of what God said. The Lord answered me. Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. So he may run who reads it. Now let's make sense. Because they they spoke in ways that, that we've got to kind of chew on before we understand it fully. God says, write the vision. Write what I'm about to answer. I want you to make it real plain. Don't write it like my brother-in-law Kevin where no one could read it. Write it plain because I want him who runs to read. Someone who gets the news needs to be able to read it so they can run and declare the word. That was their internet in the day. Guys who ran. Okay. So... And sometimes their internet ran slow. Sorry. Um, So that he may run who reads it. He'll have reason to run. He'll have good news to share. You write it plain. By the way, this is one of those verses where if you kind of untuck it a little bit, you see that the prophet's words were being written at the time. This is not The prophets were being written and God wrote it so that other people would be able to benefit from it. It's, sometimes scholars tend to forget these scriptures and tend to think that other people wrote these scriptures for their personal agendas rather than the agenda of God. Now the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It's not going to lie. If it seems slow... Wait for it. It will surely come. It won't delay. Now, king of Babylon and his country, his soul is puffed up. It's not upright within him. I'm not blind to that. I know who he is. But hear me, the righteous shall live by his faith. The righteous one is not going to be scared The righteous one is not going to hide their head in the sand. The righteous one is not going to go running. The righteous one is not going to be crying and belly aching all the time. And the righteous one surely isn't going to be puffed up. The righteous one is the one who's just going to trust me. Do you recognize that passage? Paul uses that passage in Romans 1.17. Where Paul says, starting in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the death of Christ for my sins. That's the good news. That's the gospel. I'm not ashamed that Jesus Christ died, buried, resurrected for my sins. Because that's God's power to save everyone who has faith. As it is written in Habakkuk 2.4, the righteous shall live by faith. Paul uses that passage in Galatians. Paul uses that passage as a reference in Ephesians. In fact, he contrasts the soul being puffed up with life by faith. Ephesians 2, remember? Uh, uh, For by grace you've been saved 
through faith, not by works, lest any man should boast or be puffed up. We're saved by faith, not by what we're doing. The king of Babylon, his soul was puffed up because he thought he was powerful in who he was. But he's not the righteous one. The righteous one, Habakkuk says, uh, records God saying, is the one living by faith. And, and uh, uh, with that, Habakkuk then hears God pronounce five woes upon the Babylonians. Woe to him who heaps up what's not his own. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. Now I want to pause and let's look at this woe in a little more detail because we have woven into it. Um, By the way, throughout the Gospels, throughout the the book of Acts, throughout the, the, the epistles, you have the prophets if not being quoted boldly by Paul, you have them subtly woven into the fabric of what's being... I mean, when Jesus calls uh, Peter and his brother and says, drop your nets and I'll make you fishers of men, Jesus is echoing the idea, the passage that we just read earlier. That what we've become is like a bunch of fish without a leader, without anyone to take us to salvation. Without anyone to bring us to righteousness. You've just made us like a bunch of fish, God. God says, yes, but I'm going to send one. And Jesus, when he comes, calls his apostles and says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're going to take those fish and you're going to bring them into salvation. This is echoed throughout. You'll see echoes from, from another part of Jesus here. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You, Babylonians, pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself. Show your uncircumcision. The cup is in the Lord's right hand. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter shame will come upon your glory. Here's what's being said there. You've got a cup of wrath, but God's using you to judge his people. You're not so high and mighty as you think you are. You're a tool in the hand of God. And the cup of wrath you're pouring out in judgment is God's cup of wrath. And that same cup of wrath will be poured out on you in judgment. Because God's wrath judges sin. Sin causes hurt. It causes pain, it causes anguish, it's a cancer, and it destroys. And that incurs God's wrath. Because God did not make this world for pain, misery, and destruction. And so God pours out His wrath. And the cup is in God's right hand. Now, all of us as saved people, with unrighteousness that permeates the marrow of our bones... Where does our salvation come from? The Lord Jesus. And why? What did he take of ours unto himself? Our sin. And what does God pour out on sin? Wrath. He has a cup of wrath, of judgment to pour out. And Jesus is in the garden. And what does he pray? Lord, let this cup pass from me. After you pour out the judgment, please resurrect me. Bring me back. Restore me. Be faithful to your word. The cup of wrath that Jesus is praying about in the Garden of Gethsemane is the cup of wrath we read about in Habakkuk. You read about it in Jeremiah as well. So, at the end of this, At the end of these woes, you get this passage, which I love. Um, First of all, the question, can this teach? I think it teaches. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Habakkuk, I'm going to judge Judah. I'm going to judge him with Babylon, an even more fierce nation. 
but I'm not done. I'm going to judge Babylon. And woe will come until the day that I restore things and make it right. But don't think I'm asleep. Don't think I can't hear. Don't call me idle. I'm in my holy temple. Shh. I love the Hebrew word for keep silent. It's an onomatopoeia. Those of you who've kept up your Hebrew alphabet, let me underscore that word for you here. It's the word just right next to that 90. It's right here. You see that? Hus. Hus. I think it should be translated hush. Because that's our word. That's our onomatopoeia. Hus. The Lord is in his holy temple. Hus. And with that, we go back. Habakkuk goes into his song of prayer and praise. And in his song, he praises God for who he is. And uh, let's go back to it. And he decides he's going to be faithful and wait. He's going to live by faith and wait. So after he recounts God, and he goes through the mental cerebral faith, he says, I hear and my body trembles, my lips quiver at the sound, rottenness enters into my bones, my legs tremble beneath me. I'm really scared. I'm really scared, and I don't see the way out. But I'm going to quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. And even though the fig tree doesn't blossom, even though there's no fruit on the vines, even though the olive trees aren't producing and the fields yield no food and the flocks cut off from the field and there's no herd in the stalls, I am still going to rejoice in Yahweh and take joy in the God of my salvation. Because God, the Lord, is my strength. And he makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. And with that, he brings it to a close. Because what Habakkuk found is that there are times where he can think it through. And there are times when he can experience it. But there are also times when he's going to have doubts both ways. And the one thing that never changes, the Lord is in his holy temple. Shh. Show reverence. Points for home. The righteous shall live by faith. Habakkuk is a picture image for us in another way of what it's like to be Christians. Everyone in here who is redeemed of the Lord, do we realize, and of course we do, that our sins are forgiven? That we are redeemed? That we are the victor? Who won, Jesus or Satan? Oh, come on. Who won, Jesus or Satan? Jesus. Then why do we see the enemy so much afoot right now? We live in what some scholars call the now and the not yet. It's now. The victory's been announced. It's been won. It's done. Write it in the book. Game over. But it's not here yet in its fullness. And that's the way Habakkuk had to live. Habakkuk had to live knowing that God would do what God was going to say, but it hadn't been finished yet. It had been announced, it had been written down, write it down so that everybody can see that I am going to do it exactly like I said, but it hadn't been finished. We live caught in this time vortex. So point for home. Let's live in the now and the not yet, knowing that God is faithful. And then as righteous people will live by faith. Next point. The king of Babylon sacrifices to his net. He makes offerings to his dragnet. He's swooping through the kingdoms with his military might. Thinking his power, his money... His prestige, his momentum, his position in this world 
is what he values. And God says, no, 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 no. What's valuable is living by faith in God. We need to trust in God, and we need to trust in his plans, and we need to be satisfied with nothing less but nothing more. We want God. We want his will in our life. Now, we don't want one thing less than that. We don't want the enemy to keep God's will from our lives. We pray and we work through the Holy Spirit for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're not satisfied with anything less, but we don't need God plus. God, I'd like your will, and in addition to that, I need this new bicycle. Yahweh is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Now some churches think this means that when you come to church, you're supposed to not be happy. That's not at all what this is talking about. That's not at all what this is talking about. This is talking about God far removed from this world and yet integral to this world. Reigning above this world. Haas. We used to sing this song in the hymnal church where I grew up. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Keep silent. Keep silent. Keep silent before him. When your life and your faith is in topsy-turvy land, get before the Lord. Haas. Would you pray with me? Lord, it's hard to conceive of you knowing the hearts and minds of any one of us, but that you know the hearts and the minds of the eight billion people on this planet right now is beyond our comprehension. That you know the unknown number of stars and have created every one and placed them exactly where they belong in the heavens on a course that, that you have prescribed as the heavens move. It's beyond our understanding. That you have written history, even as you have let history write itself. And the paradox of that, it's beyond our understanding. And Lord, our tendency is to get so caught up in our little world, in our moment, in our mind, and in our family, and in our work, and in our, and, and our circle... That we lose perspective of who you are. And not only what you've done, but what you've promised. So we come before you in silence, awestruck wonder. Through the blood of Jesus, we talk to you, Lord, as Father. Not, not, not as God, but as Father. And we throw ourselves before you and pray that you would grow our faith so that we could serve you exactly the way you'd have us serve you. Nothing more, nothing less. Amen.